Yeah, that was too cute not to show it. <laughs> but a good, good message all the same, uh, that we do have a Heavenly Father. I know that the idea of family conjures up both positive and negative uh, views in your minds, depending on your experience, your background, and what's taking place. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in our message today. A message is not specifically geared as a Father's Day message, but I do believe uh, the principles that we'll find in it, because it is the story of a father and son, Jacob and Joseph. We see some things that are so critical and important. Um, I do want to just reiterate what Pastor Brad shared about Vacation Bible School. The very first thing we did, even before our church existed, was have a Vacation Bible School. So it was August of 1992. Our church was to begin officially in September of 92. And we decided to gather some people from our sponsoring church, the church that started us in Hollywood, Sheridan Hills Baptist. And each morning for a week, I loaded up these wonderful volunteers, adults and teenagers, and drove them on the church bus up to Parkland to Quigley Park on Parkside Drive. And uh, in the terrible August heat of the summer of 92, just after Hurricane Andrew had hit earlier that month, we, um, we gathered, I think we had 30 or 40 kids that, that came to that first vacation Bible school because we had put the word out in the neighborhoods around that area. And it was a wonderful experience. Um, I, I know my, my wife was in the last service and I looked at her face and remembered uh, those days because she uses words like abuse and other things. We, uh, we had just had our first child, Lucy, on August the 1st. So Lucy was two or three weeks old, and there was Laura with our newborn in the heat, helping lead and teach. And, you know, at the time we didn't really think about it, but later she thought, I can't believe we did that. And um, she reminds me of that regularly. Um, <laughs> but it was good. And, and from that group of initial family contacts that we made, I think there were two families that became part of the core group of our church and ended up joining our church after we got started. So it was a wonderful, productive time um, as we got to have kind of our first inroad into the community. So since then, every single year, we have uh, had some version of Vacation Bible School because we believe so strongly in, in the work of God in the lives of young people. And even for me, because I grew up in church, I grew up every year as a child going to Vacation Bible School. And I, I remember some of those interactions and some of the fun stuff we did. And, and God used that in a powerful way in my life. So if you're volunteering this week, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being a part of that. Uh, teenagers and adults helping this week, giving of their time. Um, the good news is we have air conditioning, and so far it's been working well, so you won't be in the heat the whole time. Um, but there are going to be a lot of kids here, a lot, more than we've ever had. So from those kind of humble beginnings of 30 or 40 children, now to having more than 400 pre-registered, and you know there may be others that show up. So Thank you so much for, for making that a priority. I, d I do hope that the rest of us will just be in prayer this week, that God will do a great work. Sometimes it seems like the kids are not listening or paying attention, but there's a lot more getting in than we realize. And it comes back to roost in later years as they remember um, those things. Also, I shared with you last week that each week I want us to spend just a moment in prayer for a, a another church somewhere, either locally or far away. And so this week, I'd like for us to pray for one of our sister churches here in the city of Coral Springs, and that's First Methodist Church. Uh, my good friend Alex has been the pastor there for the last several years. He and I have gotten to know each other pretty well, and uh, we meet for coffee on a regular basis. And I'm, I'm really sad he's leaving. Um, he's actually taken a position with the Methodist denomination in Florida. So he's going to kind of their main offices, which are in Lakeland, Florida. He'll be relocating his family there. And so First Methodist will be uh, getting a new pastor. I, I think, I'm not positive, but I think he's already been selected and will will be coming if he's not already here uh, very soon because I know Alex is transitioning this summer. So I just want to pray for that church, uh, their influence in the community, and, and also for Alex and his family as they move to this new place in Lakeland. Would you join me as we pray? 
Lord, thank you so much for um, your work in the city of Coral Springs. And I, uh, I live specifically to you, our sister church, First Methodist Church on Sample Road. I, I ask God that you would um, move powerfully in that congregation. I know that they're getting ready to experience a, a transition with a new pastor um, I pray for him. I pray for his family as they come to this church to set up their new ministry there. I pray you would give him wisdom and use him. You've been uh, wonderfully using Alex these several years as he has held up the Word of God, the Bible, as truth. I pray that that would be the stance of this new pastor and that he would just lift you, Lord, up high and exalted above every, above everything else. And I lift to you the, the church. I pray that this would be a unifying uh, transition for them and that they would reach even more people for the cause of Christ. Also, Lord, I, I pray for uh, their Bethlehem Revisited. I, I don't know if that will be something that will continue, but because they've had such a, a long history of the Bethlehem Revisited event, each Christmas. If it is your plan for them to continue that, I pray that it would be even more fruitful than it's been in the past, that more people would come, that more would hear the story of Jesus and the impact that he can make in their lives. Lord, I'll also pray for Alex and this transition for he and his family as they make their way to Lakeland. I pray you would work out every detail, uh, provide friends, provide housing, provide a new church for them to be a member of as he will now be working in the denominational offices. And I just pray you give him wisdom in his new leadership role. Thank you, Lord, for, uh, for what you're doing. We pray that all the churches of Coral Springs would be encouraged to proclaim the truth about you without any apology. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, um, we are looking today in Genesis chapter 46, beginning in verse 31, and we're going to go all the way through chapter 47, verse uh, 26. There we go. I prepared the sermon, so I should know where we're going, right? Okay, that's what we're doing. We're going to look at it in two parts. So the first part is uh, verse 31 all the way through chapter 47, verse 12. And then we'll look at the balance of the, the passage in 47 uh, all, all the way up to verse 26 for the second part of the message. Again, it's not, a, it's not really a Father's Day message in that I'm not just pinpointing and focusing on dads. However, because this story is a family story, there are principles here that are significant for moms, dads, and all of us uh, to, to grab hold of. The the point of the, the story up to now is that Joseph, kind of our lead character in this true story that we're looking at from thousands of years ago, Joseph has been through a ringer in his life. He was abused, um, kind of despised by his siblings, his brothers. Uh, they would beat him. They eventually uh, threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery, uh, told his dad Jacob that he was dead. He then went off with these slave traders. He was accused of a crime he did not commit, falsely imprisoned for years, then released from prison because he was an interpreter of dreams, given that power by God. He happened to interpret the dream of Pharaoh, which set Egypt up for great success. And now, at this point in the story, Joseph is the second in command of all of Egypt. He's not Egyptian. But he has been given this authority by Pharaoh because Pharaoh found favor on him because of the incredible help that he has given to the nation of Egypt where he said, you know, there, your dream, Pharaoh says, that there will be seven years of, of uh, plenty and then there will be seven years of famine. And during the years of plenty, we need to set aside in storehouses so that in the seven years of famine, there will be enough food to sustain our nation as well as the nations around us. And so Pharaoh found favor in, in that interpretation. He then said, okay, then you're the one in charge. I'm putting you in charge to make sure that happens. Now Joseph's family has come down from the land of Canaan, which is to the north. They are in Egypt. Uh, he has helped them several times. They now have been reunited happily. Uh, they, all the boys have grown and matured in, in the ways of God, and they are sad and remorseful for what they did to Joseph. Joseph has forgiven them. There is no ill will between them. And now the famine is so bad that Jacob, his father, and the sons and their families are now relocating to Egypt so that they might uh, live out their days there. 
And that's where we pick up the story here in verse 31. Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation, you shall say, um, you shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth even until now, both we and our fathers, in order that uh, you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, my father and my brothers, with their flocks and herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. They're now in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers, he took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds as our fathers were. They, were, they said to Pharaoh, we have come to sojourn in the land for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks and for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. And now please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you the land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen. And if you know any able men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. And then Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and stood him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said, Pharaoh said to Jacob, how many are the days of the years of your life? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. Then Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with food, according to the number of their dependents. We'll stop there for just a moment and, and give you these sort of takeaways that I see in God's hand in their lives and in their response to God and in their response to their situation, which is obviously a very difficult situation because of the famine. The first thing that I think we should notice here is the simple divine providence. Simple divine providence. And, and I really want to emphasize the word simple because oftentimes as we read the Word of God and we see the stories and the unfolding of God's grace, we, we have a view that God is doing these miraculous things in these very miraculous and out-of-the-ordinary situations. But what we see here is a very simple situation. There's no food. There is a famine. Something has to be done for them to survive. And so God is providentially putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. And in fact, you could say he's been doing that since before Jacob was even born, much less Joseph. He knew that these things were going to happen. And furthermore, he is orchestrating these things to happen because he is sovereign and because he knows this is the unfolding story. We say, well, that's all fine and well. What does that have to do with me? Well, here's what it has to do with us. The same God who orchestrated the details of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now Joseph's lives is the same God that we serve today, is the same God that oversees our lives, is the same God that has a plan for us and looks into and in some ways manages the details of our lives because he is sovereign. It's often difficult for us to receive that truth when things are challenging, and, and we're okay to receive that truth when things are not so challenging. But God knows what he is doing, and God has a plan in his divine providence. God works in the everyday details of all of our lives. And I think we should walk away from this story with that in our mind and that in our hearts and, and superimpose that on our own lives to say, okay, if that is true, Lord, what is it you're trying to show me in my everyday life? Number two, we see in the, the brothers and in Joseph and in Jacob even, systematic hard work. Work is good. Let me say that again. Work is good. God designed us and purposed us on earth 
to work. Adam and Eve worked in the garden before they fell in sin. They tended the garden. That was their job. Now, we have a mindset in the West primarily that sees work as a necessary evil. I hope you'll reconsider that work is a necessary good, not a necessary evil. God has called us to work. Um, in the West, we, we look forward to what we call at the end of work, when our working years are over, what do we call it? Retirement. Retirement. Do you know that that is not biblical? I'm just saying. There's no concept of retirement in God's Word. And what has happened is, um, oftentimes people have planned well enough financially that they can retire from receiving income. Now that is biblical. That's a good thing to plan for the future so that our finances and our lives are taken care of. So I encourage you to follow that biblical plan. Uh, stewardship is not just about what you give. It's also about how you manage what you keep. And part of that is to save it as you pay off your debts and do the other necessary things. But having said that, that doesn't mean now I get to go eat bonbons and kick my feet up while I watch the surf crash onto the beach and do absolutely nothing with my life. It may be that you come to a place in your life when you no longer have to work for income to, to provide and to live and to survive, but it's that time in life, especially if your health allows, that God may choose to do the greatest work in you because you have more time to give. You still have to be paid for it. And so I want to encourage you to think differently about that. Don't think retirement. Think, how can I joyfully work until the day God takes me home? Because that's what God's called us to. I'm convinced as I look in the lives of some senior adults who are living longer and longer, in addition to just better health care, uh, those who, who live life with joy and purpose and are serving and working, they seem to have more to live for. It's as if God gives them a reason to continue because there's more that he has for them. So let's all take a lesson from those people. My dad um, had worked for the same company for 40 years. So he had one, you could argue he had one job. He had a lot of different positions in that company, but one company that he worked for all of his adult life. He went to work for that company at 18 years old. And except for two years of uh, required military service, he spent all of those 40 years with the same company. So at 60 years old, my dad received a phone call from the corporate office that said, the job that you have is changing. There are several of you around the country right now, but we're combining down just to have two of your position. And you're the senior person in that position. You've been there the longest. And so what we're going to do is we're going to offer you one of those two positions first. And if you want it, it's yours, but you have to move. And where he had to move was a very cold place. And he said, you know, I think we're okay financially where I could just go ahead and take retirement now. They said, well, if you want to do that, we'll you know, do these things for you and help you with that decision. And so they were gracious to my dad after all those years. And, and they gave him a package and he stepped away uh, from the company. When that happened, I wondered what would happen with my dad because my dad was a faithful, loyal, get up every day, go to work, do your job, do what you have to do, and come home and do it again tomorrow. That was my dad's life. But during that time, as soon as my dad retired, he was already a faithful leader at the church. He had served as a deacon. He, he taught a men's uh, small group Sunday school class on Sundays. He, he was involved in the church, he and my mom both, as volunteers. But at that point, he realized, you know, I've got more time now. I'm not going to work every day, so now I'm going to serve more in the church. He became the chairman of the deacons a, a couple of the next five years. He, he, uh, he began to serve. It was really funny. He began to serve in the senior adult ministry. Now, he was 60, 61, 62, 63. He was like a kid in the senior adult ministry uh, because they were in their 80s and 90s. But they would take trips, and they would do things to the church, and so he would help coordinate those things and be a part of that all as a volunteer because, again, he didn't need the income. Uh, but God had given him that privilege. Little did we know at 60 when he retired that at 65 we would be burying him. 
because God called him home at 65. He was diagnosed with cancer and died soon after. And so those last few years of his life, while they were different, they were just as full of the work that God had called him to as all the prior years where he had been serving and going into a paying job every, uh, every day. So I just encourage you that hard work is God's plan. And, and if we do that hard work with joy, it changes the way we view it. I don't have to go to work. I get to go to work. I have a job. Praise be to God. Some people can't say that. God has provided this incredible opportunity for me. It may not be where I want to be forever, but it's a part of the process. It's a part of God's plan. It's a, and that is a decision every single day. Or you can say, I hate my job. I hate my boss. I am the boss and I hate my boss. I mean, you know, I, I don't know what, the, what it may be, but you, you may have that experience and you're just like, oh, beating your head against the wall. It's not going to get better in that regard. Ask God to give you a new heart about the work that he's called you to do. And remember that whatever your work is, there's a mission field there for you. There are people that you're interacting with. There are situations that are coming up. There are co-workers, uh, whatever the case may be. And, and, and that is your mission field in part, uh, that God might give you that one conversation. Uh, if, if the people where you work, if you work with other people and not by yourself, if the people that you work with, are, um, they come to know of your relationship to God and they see a genuineness in your life that is real, when, when they have a crisis, and they will, you may be the one they pull aside at work one day and say, could I ask you something? And they just share. And you're going to go, why is he talking to me? Well, because you have something maybe that they don't have, Jesus. Look for those opportunities and, and, and receive great joy in the work that God has given you. That's what happened with the brothers. And now Pharaoh sees it. Pharaoh, this godless, pagan, not a follower of God for sure. Egypt, not a nation that followed God. And God softens the heart of Pharaoh. Later in Exodus, we'll see that God hardens the heart of Pharaoh. But here, he softens the heart of Pharaoh. And he, he recognizes the hard work of Joseph's family. And he rewards that hard work by saying, I want your brothers to manage my livestock. No small task. So, systematic hard work. Uh, third, we see sacred family life. Sacred family life. This is a picture of a family. Families are a blessing from God. Unless you're in one of those families and you would say, you don't know my family. Maybe your family is a blessing from God, and I do know that I am privileged and blessed to have grown up in a family where mom and dad love Jesus, sister who loved Jesus. Um, they lived an example of Christ, certainly not perfect. There are many holes. I mean, we, we got a Swiss cheese family like everyone else does, but in general, I saw a direction toward God, not away from Him, and that was a blessing to me. I'm still very close to my mom. I'm very close to my sister. I uh, spoke with both of them yesterday even, though they live in another state. So there's a closeness there, and, and we continue uh, that, that joyful journey together. But maybe you're not from that family. Maybe you're from that family that was not a blessing. Maybe you were abused. Uh, maybe you were neglected. Maybe your life has, has been challenging and, and difficult. In our membership class, we... Um, when Laura and I are teaching about what it means to be a part of a church, because that's a great understanding of joining Park Ridge Church, or any church for that matter, um, we, we talk about how the Lord, one of the illustrations that God uses of the church is that the church is a family. And it's interesting, we get one of three looks from every person when we share that. There's the blank face who doesn't ever change their facial expression in any setting, so that I don't know what they're thinking, they're just blank. Then the other two looks we get are, there's the look of a frown, like, oh, I already have a family that I don't like, I don't want another one. 
And then there's the person who smiles, and, and you know that, oh, they probably have a positive experience about family. They think, great, another family. That's awesome. Um, so I don't know your story. I mean, I know some of your stories, but I don't know where all of you stand with the Lord and where all of you stand with your family. But understand, just as we heard from the, the children on the video, God is a loving Father. And if you're from a great family, God's family is even better. And if you're from a dysfunctional family, God's family is functional, as it was designed to be. So, when families function as God intended them to function, they are the greatest of human relationships. No question. Our children are at that point where they are beginning to leave. Our oldest just got married. They are moving in the middle of next month out of state. Still a little angry about that. Our next two children are in college in other states. So they kind of come and go in the, in the summers. Yesterday was uh, our son's birthday, and yet he's all the way over in California on an assignment this summer. He couldn't be with us. We couldn't be with him. We talked to him on the phone, but it's not the same, you know, as he celebrated his birthday. And, um, so we're at that point where there's a coming and a going, and, and we have this family vacation plan later in the summer. And right now, we're about 90% sure that all, now seven of us, because there's that son-in-law that came in, all seven of us will be able to, to go together on this vacation. We like him, by the way. We're, we're glad he's, he's in the family. Don't misunderstand. I married them, so it must be okay with me. But, you know, those are rare privileges. And for us, because generally we have a happy family, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but for us, that's a good thing. Now, that may not be your story, and I, I recognize that that may not be your story, but I want you to understand, God can more than make up for the pain, the struggle, the difficulty, the loss, whatever it may be, the abuse in your family. And, and He can give a sacredness to your family experience that you would not otherwise have. So I, I encourage you to, to keep looking at that. And, and Joseph's story, I mean, talk about dysfunction. Huh, what a mess. But now God's brought them back together, and God's doing a great work in their story. And then last, number four, a significant ordinary life. A significant ordinary life. Jacob used the word sojourning three times. He, he said twice about his own sojourning, so his own life and the things, the way he's been living all these years. And then he talked, he used the word sojourning to describe his fathers before him, their sojourning, their lives, how it had been longer than his to date. There's nothing fantastic about the word sojourn. It, it basically means he's just doing what he was doing to live. In the Great Commission, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, the word go is not a command. In the literal understanding of the tense of that word, make disciples is a command. It's an imperative verb, make disciples. But go is a word that really means as you are going, as you are waking up, as you are going about your day, as you are going to work, as you are driving on the highway, as you are going to the doctor's appointment, as you are going to school, as you're going to the sporting event, as you're going on vacation, whatever, whatever you're doing, as you are going. That's the idea of sojourning. Life is full of just stuff we need to do. It's not very flashy. It's not very sensational. I got up this morning, and you'll be glad to know I brushed my teeth. And I hope most, if not all, of you did the same. You cleaned up. You put clothes on. Thank you for that. You know, our days oftentimes are just filled with the next thing we have to do. And it can seem very humdrum and unexciting. But it's in those moments that God, times, God sometimes does His greatest work. So it's not insignificant ever. We did wake up this morning. We are here now. I'm breathing. God gave me another breath of air to breathe. That is no small thing. It is significant. 
And when we miss those things that God does, we go through life sort of stumbling over ourselves thinking, my life doesn't matter. Oh, but it does. Don't ever believe that it doesn't. It does because God has placed you here. Now, in that regard, there are these three qualities of life I want us to notice that we see, I think, in the next part of the passage. So let me quickly read that and then speak to it very briefly. Now, there was no food in all the land. Now, the famine was at its most severe point right now, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, just to the north, languished by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. And Joseph answered, Give your livestock And I will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph. And Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, the donkeys. He supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when that year was ended, they came to him the following year. And they said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of livestock are my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. That's all we got. Nothing else. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for all the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe on them. The land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made servants of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priest he did not buy, for the priest had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here's seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And at the harvest you shall give a fifth, 20% to Pharaoh, and four-fifths shall be your own as seed for the field, and as food for yourselves and your households, and as food for your little ones. And they said, you have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. So Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, and it stands to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth. The land of the priest alone did not become Pharaoh's. Now, We see in this plan, while it it may seem harsh, imagine that you're about to die. And there is nothing else that you can do. All options have been exhausted. All that's left, first year our animals, second year us and our land. That's it. There's nothing else that we can do. But the the grain is there, so the grain is, is provided as they surrender all of these things. Joseph was very wise and he, he was used to help lead in this decision-making process. Three things I see, and these are great qualities that, that we all need in our lives. First is the area of discretion or wisdom. You could call it either thing, discretion or wisdom. Joseph showed this quality in handling a very difficult situation. The absence of thought is always the presence of weakness. Let me say that again. The absence of thought is always the presence of weakness. The presence of thought and responsibility is mature. So what am I saying? Well, God has given you and God has given me a brain. It's a gift from God. We should use that gift for His glory and for our wisdom. It is right for us to pray and ask for God's wisdom. It is right for us to approach other people who maybe have experienced similar challenges that we're facing in our life and ask for their wisdom. But it's also right to know that we have the capacity to think and we have the capacity to reason and we have the opportunity to step back from the situation and say, hmm, what should I do as I pray and ask for God's wisdom? This seems to be the way I should go and move in that direction. Oftentimes people ask me, how do I know that I'm doing what God wants me to do? That's a tough question. Sometimes there are several good answers. And you can't always know the answer. But what God has done for me and for others that I've spoken with is he gives this sense of 
rightness. It is right for me to move in this direction. It seems best. And, and so I would say, do so. What if the decision is bad? It will be sometimes. Don't keep doing that. Do something else now. Say, I just made a bad decision. Let's back up and try something different. The, the danger is that you make a bad decision and you just keep going down that path. That, well, that's what I said I was going to do, so I'm going to do it. Or as I fall off a cliff. No, don't do that. If you know that it was bad, you've learned from it, back up, make a different decision. That's what wise people do. So I encourage you to, to use the wisdom and the discretion and the responsibility that God has given you for His glory. It becomes a great lesson to our children as well as they see that. Next we see in Joseph, timeliness. Timeliness. When the people of Egypt came with their problems, Joseph didn't say, all right, let me go think about that, and I'll get back to you next month. Why? They would have been dead next month. They had no food. Joseph made a decision. He heard the information. He thought quickly what would be best. He made the decision and moved forward. He'd been given that authority by Pharaoh, so he could do it. But he actually did it. We live in a time often when people are afraid to make decisions. There is such a hesitation because I don't want to make the wrong decision. Not deciding is a decision and it's a bad one. Decide. Make a decision. Move forward. Like I've already said, if it's the wrong decision, that's okay. Acknowledge it. You'll know quickly if it's the wrong decision. Uh-oh, that wasn't right. That was not a good thing. Own it. Apologize if you've hurt people in the midst of that decision, especially if, it, if it's been within your family. Dad messed up. Mom messed up. I messed up. I was wrong. We're not going to do it that way again. Lesson learned. But here's the new thing we're going to do. Make a decision. Be willing. Be courageous to make a decision. And, uh, and God will honor that so that we avoid the danger of being consumed by passivity. Passivity. Um, it's a dangerous thing. Discretion and timing, wisdom and timing, they go hand in hand. They work together for families, for companies, for churches, for individuals, for any reason to move forward in the plans that God has. And then last, I, I see the quality of completion. Completion. Joseph finished all that he started. He began with the end in mind. It's a great quality. I have the um, responsibility um, of overseeing oftentimes memorial services, funeral services for those who have died. And every single time I do that, I'm humbled and I'm reminded of my own mortality. One day... People will gather to remember me. I mean, I hope they'll gather. I, you know. And it's interesting. I say that a little bit in jest, but I have showed up at memorial services, which I'm leading, and there have been four, five, six people present. And I've thought, hmm. And then I've shown up at memorial services here and in a couple other places room cannot contain all the people who show up. And I think, wow, a life that has impacted people. Now, all of us have influence over people in some way. Our children, our friends, our peers, our co-workers, our family. We we have influence. Will we make any difference in their lives as a result of the influence that we have? And when it is our memorial service, granted, we won't be there, but what will be said about us? Are you living with the end 
in mind. We have an opportunity today to make a difference. How do I know that? We're all alive right now. Yep, it's beating. What difference will you make today and for all the days that God has for you? Joseph made some huge differences for the work of God. Will you? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for um, the story of Joseph, the story of Jacob. Jacob, his father, had so many issues, and yet, Lord, you, you chose in the midst of this dysfunctional family where deceit, deception, trickery, immorality, murder, there are, there's so many terrible things that happened in this family, Lord, but yet you worked through the people in this story to bring about your glory your plan. Lord, if you can work in their life, you can work in ours. And so right now, I pray for anyone who is here that does not yet know you, they have not yet been adopted into your family, that they would um, surrender their heart, that they would, by the power and presence of your grace, be drawn to your family and recognize that there is a place for them in the family of God. Even today that they would come to that place of decision. And Lord, for those of us who already are in your family, we know you, we know that we have been adopted, though we are undeserving. You have stooped in your grace to provide a hope, to provide a future, to provide our forgiveness, to provide eternity. Um, Lord, we oftentimes become consumed in our own struggles and we forget the wonder and the gift that has been given to us. And so I pray, Lord, uh, wherever we are today, that we would just be reminded of who we are in Christ. Lord, I, I pray as we enter into this time of decision that you would move powerfully among your people. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we sing together, uh, the front of our church is open. I invite you to, uh, to respond to God. If, if there is a, a, a need in your life, maybe you need wisdom for a decision, Maybe there's a timing issue. Maybe there's a family struggle of some kind. It could be anything. A diagnosis has recently been given and you're afraid, wondering what's next. Whatever the case may be, I invite you to step out and to come and, and pray here. Maybe you're praying for someone else, a friend or a co-worker who is going through some difficulty. Come. The front is open. We welcome you to come and spend time in prayer. I'll be standing here if you have spiritual questions. If you are one of those that is ready to receive Christ today and begin a, a relationship with Him and a walk with Him, uh, it would be my great joy to talk with you more about what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. So would you stand now and you come as we sing together as God leads.
So, this week is going to be something. We're going to have lots of little people all over the, the property here. Um, these buildings were built in large part to accommodate children and families. And we're going to stretch them to the nth degree this week. Thank you so much for the volunteers who are coming. Thank you for those of you entrusting your children here. Uh, we pray that this will be a high watermark in their, their walk with God and their understanding of what it means to follow God. But we just want to pray that God will do a great work this week. Would you join me? Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, allowing all these young people to come to the property, your property, your place, your church. And so I ask, Lord, that you would do amazing things in their lives this week. I pray for the volunteers, give them joy and endurance through the course of the week. I pray that your word would be proclaimed. I pray that everything that we do, whether transitioning between classes, craft time, recreation time, snack time, worship time, everything, Lord, that it would be for your glory and your honor. Some, Lord, of these children are going to be great, great leaders one day soon. Company leaders, ministry leaders, military leaders. Um, political leaders, Lord, leaders in families, all of them will have influence if you allow them to live. And so I just ask God that you would grow them into the people that you want them to be and that this week would be a part of that process for them and for all of us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.